that. Turn with me this morning to <coughs> Revelations in chapter 13. I have found Revelations to be very interesting. And I've found it to be quite a challenge also. It's, uh, it's full of twists and turns along the way, it seems like. Now, in Revelations chapter 13 and verse number 1, it says this. This is John, the apostle, speaking. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. This is uh, symbolic, of course, and uh, the beast that he is describing here is actually a person. He saw this beast rise up out of the sea. And uh, he referred to this beast as having seven heads. And seven is the number of completion in the Bible. Anytime you see the word seven, it's the number of completion or the number of perfection in some places. But uh, in this particular case, it's more or less the number of completion. In other words, this man that he saw here with the uh, seven heads meant that this fellow was uh, quite intelligent. He wasn't, he wasn't like me. He had a whole lot of intelligence, a lot of IQ, a lot of intellect, and uh, this man was quite persuasive and... Uh, he uh, he didn't lack a whole lot in, in that area, quite educated and such. So I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And that term beast, Paul used that earlier. If you remember when Paul was on his missionary trip, one of his missionary trips, and he was in Ephesus, and Ephesus was a, a city that uh, worshipped idols. And they had a goddess by the name of Diana. And he ran into a whole lot of opposition there, and he got in trouble there, got arrested there. And he wrote later in one of his, one of his uh, letters that uh, he had fought with beasts in Ephesus. And he referred to those idol worshipers. He called them beasts. And this man right here, John, he said, I stood up on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. So he's talking about right here, I believe he's talking about, and we're going to find this out before this chapter's over. He's referring to these people as being beasts, but they're into idol worship as well, just like they were over in Ephesus. And coming up out of the sea, this person right here, when John saw this person, he was standing on the, on the, out on the sand of the sea. And uh, he was on the Isle of Patmos, surrounded by water. He was in the midst of the Aegean, Aegean part of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, whichever direction he looked, wherever he was at there on that island, whichever direction he looked at, there was sea. But evidently this means that this person is uh, from the, uh, across the Aegean Sea, across the Mediterranean Sea, I meant to say, away from him. Now, he said he had seven heads, and we talked about that. This man was quite intelligent. Uh, he was quite, quite well educated educated and such and he and upon his he said having seven heads and ten horns we find that these ten horns are ten <coughs> nations that is a confederation of nations that is under this man's control 
and the ten horns is is uh, uh, represents ten leaders of ten nations. If we wanted to go into a whole lot of detail and get way down deep into all this, we would we could go back to Ezekiel and we could go back to the book of Daniel and we could find out where Ezekiel prophesied of these things and we could find out where Daniel prophesied of these things uh, centuries and centuries earlier than John. And uh, we would find out uh, that the old Roman Empire has uh, comes into play here. The areas of land where Rome at one time, back in Jesus' time, where uh, Rome controlled certain parts of the, of the area there, this man right here is going to uh, revive those those nations and uh, rule and reign over them. Now they're going to have their own presidents or kings or prime ministers or whatever they call them over there, but they're going to have an allegiance to him. Not only that, but he's going to have influence over the whole world. In other words, there's not going to be any uh, commerce going on unless unless it goes through this leader that we're talking about, that he's seeing right here. I stood upon the sand of the, of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. So they, these people were, these ten nations had ten leaders, and they were subject unto this one person. And upon his head is the name of blasphemy. So this man may have been well educated. And he may have been highly intelligent. He may have been had a lot of charisma and quite charming and uh, blessed with the ability to, of leadership. But he was a very ungodly person that he's seeing here. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, that is Satan, gave him his power and his seat, his position, and great authority. This man is reached uh, the highest position in the world at this time, and John said, you can thank Satan for that, that he got it, everything he got through the influence of Satan. Now, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded, and remember this is symbolically speaking, you know, he uh, described him having seven heads. In other words, he was complete in his uh, intelligence as far as that goes. But he said, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So evidently, <clears throat> when this man comes into power, something is going to happen to uh, cause a, him to have a deadly wound. And uh, it says... His wound was healed. So, there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot, been a lot of discussion uh, up through the centuries as to how to interpret this. Now, I'm not sure to how to interpret it my own self, but it says he was wounded to death. So, I take it that he, would, he died. But his wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, what we're seeing come into play right here is this man is an anti-Jesus. He's in the place of Jesus. He is trying to portray himself as being 
the Messiah or the the Son of God or the Christ. And we see him as dead. And then we see him as coming back to life. And I really don't know if uh, how that how that comes comes into play, but I do know this: in our day and time, we have technology, and. I've seen this happen on TV before, watching medical shows, where a person is clinically dead, and they do things to them and bring them back to life, you know, with the shock electric paddles and things. I've seen it happen on TV, but... Then on the other hand, is this some kind of a supernatural thing that takes place where some way or another this man is empowered by some supernatural power and he is resurrected from the dead? I think it must be. If that be the case... Who did that? I've always been under the impression that there's only one person that can give life and restore life and resurrect. And I've always been under the impression that that was God. God could resurrect. God's always allowed them power to a point. Demonic. The demon demons have. No. Commentary here says the empire and the truer receive supernatural strength from Satan. Yeah, God's always allowed them power to a point, but he, he, they are under his control. So that being the case, then, say if Satan did it, according to what Jeff is saying, then that God him, God allowed Satan to do it. So. We'll accept that. He's on a leash. He's on a leash. Okay. He's, he can only do what God allows him to do. He's above all a counterfeiter. He's saying, look at me. God can do this. I can do it too. I am God. But he is a counterfeiter. And in... The uh, father of lies. Back in Egypt when Moses... Uh, exactly. That's was, what I was going was to say there, next. Yeah, he counterfeited counterfeited what Moses was doing back in Egypt with the uh, rod and it turned into a snake and things of that nature. Now, and up until a point and then the Egyptian magicians could not do anymore. Right. They, they, they couldn't. So, limited. Satan is limited. Now, we'll go with that. Because I don't have a better explanation. We, we will go with that. And they worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast. Now the dragon gave power to the beast. The dragon being Satan. The beast being the Antichrist that was wounded. And they worship the beast. Saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him. Now this beast right here, this false Jesus, this anti-Christ, anti-Jesus, was a warmonger. He was a troublemaker. Now, he ruled the world, though, with an iron hand, and uh, if you think Adolf Hitler was bad and his allies, Mussolini and some of them, if you think those guys were bad, they were Boy Scouts, 
compared to this fellow that's going to come on the scene one of these days. Now, they worshiped this man. Instead of these people that were, that should be worshiping God, they worshiped this man. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things of blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now that particular power that was given unto him to continue for three and a half years, three and a half more years, was given to him from God this time. And like Jeff said, he's on a leash. He's only he's only given so much time. Given unto him a mouth speaking great things of blasphemy. This man is anti God. He speaks harsh, he speaks bad against anything that is good and anything that is godly, he's against it. <clears throat> but his time is short. He's got 42 months, and then he's going to have to face up uh, and stand before God for his blasphemies and his anti-God lifestyle. It says he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name God is name God's name is blasphemed and he's saying to these people God can't take care of you like I can take care of you God is not as powerful as he claims to be I'm as powerful I am powerful He makes fun of his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven Now it was given unto him to make war with the saints. I find that interesting. It says to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. He was given unto it was given unto him to make war with the saints. What saints? The saints have already been raptured out about right at three and a half years earlier at the beginning of the tribulation period. Well, when the tribulation period begins, the saints are raptured out, church is raptured out. There's no one left on earth except those who missed the rapture, unsaved people. So evidently we're seeing people get saved during this time, during this seven year period of time. Now I want to point out something to you. I want to point you to the grace of God right here in this. Why didn't God just wait to the middle of the tribulation period before he raptured the church out? Because of the grace of God and the foreknowledge of God. You see, if he raptures the church out at the very beginning and some man's driving along and he looks over and his wife's gone and his kids is gone. And that happens all over the world. And Sunday morning comes and you drive past a church and there's only two cars, three cars in the parking lot now where there used to be a hundred. There's only two or three. You poke your head in that church and there's only a half a dozen people in there where there used to be 200. What happened to all those people? Everybody else is going to wonder, where did everybody go? They're going to know what happened to them. They're going to figure it out pretty shortly. 
that they was caught up in the rapture and the rest of us are the left behinds, unsaved people. So that gives these people a chance, a set, another chance right here to repent and to trust Jesus as their Savior. And that's where we see these saints come in right here. These are people who got saved after the rapture took place. He opened his mouth blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle unto them that dwell in heaven. It was given unto him to make war with these saints. And he does. And they are uh, open season on them, just like on rabbits and deers. And to overcome them, he kills them, he imprisons them. He does everything to them, tortures them and such. Power was given in him over all kindred, all tongues, and all nations. This man has risen to the top at this point in time. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Listen to this. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> I want to tell you something. Once these people worship this man, once these people, and we're going to get on into it here in a minute, once these people take the mark of the beast, they have made a commitment to Satan and their names will be stricken out of the book of life, never to be written back in it ever again. And it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Those whose names are in the book of life, still in the book of life, those who uh, are saved won't but they, they'll pay a price for not worshiping him, and it will cost them their life if they get caught. Written in the book of life, lamb sla of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. He's talking to the saints right there in that 10th verse, and he's telling them that there's a time coming when this is all going to be over with, and he's saying to these people right here that whatever you endure here on earth, is going to be worth it when this is all over with. Now, they may not know how long it, this is going to take to be over with, but they should know because they've got the same book right here that we've got. They should know that the whole of this time is seven years. The great tribulation of this time, the greater part of it, the harder part of it, tougher part of it is the last three and a half years. And it says in verse 11, And I behold an another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he, had, and he spake as a dragon. Here's a fellow who was a leader, charismatic his own self, but he posed as a lamb. In other words, he was a religious leader, but in reality, he appeared to be a religious leader, 
but in reality he spake as a dragon. He spake as the devil. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. He was his right-hand man. He was his vice president, so to speak, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now we're going to get into worship again. They're not worshiping God. They have drafted themselves their own God, this false Antichrist. And we see three people in play now. We see the dragon. We see the Antichrist. And we see this third person come on the scene, the false prophet. And we see an unholy trinity formed just like we see the Holy Trinity, which is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're now seeing on earth here this unholy trinity, which is Satan. Then we see the Antichrist. And then we see the working man here that causes things to happen, the false prophet, the unholy trinity. And the false prophet says right here, it says that he causes people to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. It says, and he does great wonders so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he has power to do in the sight of men. <clears throat> and he says to them that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. We just learned something new right then. What kind of a wound he had. He wasn't injured in a car wreck or didn't fall down and bump his head. He was injured by a weapon. In this case, it said a, a sword or a sword, but he was injured by a weapon. Evidently, somebody tried to assassinate him. But let me go back over some of this. He deceiveth them. Let's start at the 12th verse. And he exercised all power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell thereon, listen, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now I want you to notice something right here. Just as the Holy Spirit points people to Jesus and, and, and encourages us and aids us and abeds us and enables us to worship Jesus. This fellow right here, this false prophet, points the people on earth to the Antichrist to worship him. And let me point out to you something. When we when the Holy Spirit, we can't come to Jesus except through the Spirit. The Spirit has to draw us because we are so depraved on our own, we don't even know we're lost until the Holy Spirit points us in that direction. And then that conviction comes upon us. Who is that? That's our Holy Spirit convicting us and convincing us that of our sinful condition and that we're even lost in the first place. Without his help, we would go all through life and go to the grave, never understanding that we was lost. Now, he points us to Christ. And when he saves us, when Jesus saves us, we're saved forever. And we don't lose that. 
Now look at this fellow right here. He points people to the Antichrist. And once he points them to the Antichrist and they become a follower of the Antichrist, they become lost forever. They don't become saved forever like the Holy Spirit does for us and like Jesus does for us. It's the opposite. It's Antichrist. They become lost forever and cannot be saved. We become saved and can't be lost. They become lost and can't be saved. It says he deceives them that dwells on the earth. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth. That's what the Bible teaches us. We shall know that truth, and that truth shall set us free and make us free. This fellow leads, us, leads them into lies and deception by the means of those miracles which he has power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword, sword, and did live. <clears throat> he leads them away from Christ and says to these people, worship somebody else other than Christ. The Holy Spirit says to us to worship God through Jesus Christ. And this fellow right here says, don't do that. He says, worship this beast. He even made an image of the beast which had the wound and told the people that they should worship that beast, that image of that beast. So instead of leading them to worship God, he leads, leads them to worship the Antichrist. And he hath power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He says you either worship this beast right here, this image of this beast, are you going to be put to death one or the other? Now, that brings me to another question. What's the image of the beast? And how does, how does it appear to be alive? Well, we've got technology, you know, we've got big screens and such. I just don't know how that's going to work. Then on the other hand, we've got robotics in our day and age of high tech. But at some, in some way or another, there's going to be an image of this Antichrist and people are going to be uh, forced to worship that beast or be put to death one or the other. And he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell save he that hath the mark, or he that hath the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, when you become a follower of this Antichrist, you need to identify with him. So how are you going to identify with the Antichrist? Well, I know how we identify ourselves as followers of Jesus. We go into the baptismal waters. We're baptized. And we identify ourselves as followers of Jesus. This fellow right here says, well, you're going to have to be identified as a follower of the Antichrist. And he says, here's how you're going to do it. You're not going to be baptized. You're going to receive a mark in your hand or in your forehead. And when you do that, you will be identified as a follower of this person right here. Now, <clears throat> once we identify ourselves as followers of Jesus, once we become followers of Jesus, like I said a minute ago, 
we're saved and can't be lost. But once we, once they become a follower of the Antichrist and they receive that mark, they become lost and can't be saved. Now, he calls us all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And no man may buy or sell, save he that has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of the beast. Now, in that time, if you don't have that mark, one of the things that's done told us, you're going to be killed. We found that in verse 15. There's going to be a bounty put out on all those people who refuse that mark, and they will be killed. Then on top of that, you won't be able to buy or sell during that time if you don't have that mark. We're going to have high tech, and when you go up to the grocery store and you step up to pay your bill, if you if when they scan that mark, scan you for that mark, when they scan those people for that mark, if they don't have that mark and cannot find that mark, they can't have those groceries. You won't be able to have a telephone. You can't pay your bill. You won't be able to have electricity or running water. You won't be able to go to the clothing store, to Walmart or anywhere else where you have to pay for something because when they scan you, that, those people, they won't have that mark. So they won't be able to buy or sell. They'll be without food, running water, electricity. They won't have insurance. They won't be able to license their automobile. They won't be able to go into a hospital because they won't have that scan. This fella is going to rule in that way. Now, and that no man may buy or sell save he that hath that mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. The mark of the beast will be six, six, six. That's all I can tell you about that. That's all the scriptures tells us about him. We don't know anything else about him other than he will more than likely be a Gentile. The beast will be a Gentile. The Antichrist will be a Gentile. He will persecute Christians and Jews. And it makes good sense that he would be a Gentile to persecute Jews. And the uh, false prophet would more than likely be a Gentile also. And as far as the number 666, I can...